it's worth sticking around for. So, our next speaker is Paul Mokopetris. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Paul. Paul is the inventor of DNS. It's a hugely influential figure in the world of tech. Um, anyone involved in the tech industry is going to be, uh, is going to find Paul's insights really useful. So, please welcome to the stage for our final talk of today, Paul Mokopetris. I need the clicker. One second. Hi, well, while I wait for the clicker to arrive, uh, I'm talking about uh, ancient history here, DNS. Thank you very much. Uh, DNS and Darwin, um, and the reason I picked this title is because I believe that being able to create systems that can evolve very quickly and have multiple generations very quickly is the way to success, uh, which I guess makes me fashionable today uh, with all this talk of DevOps and so forth. Um, DNS is about identifiers. Um, so, for example, all of the email addresses that I have are all derived off of domain names on the right-hand side of the at sign. So we're going to talk about how we got to where we are today. And how we get a clicker that works. Whoops. Sorry, I just... Uh, I never know whether or not people are going to introduce me, so I have this slide just to show that I can't keep a job or an interest over time. Um, I'm here because I invented the domain name system, but I've also been involved in the academic world for a good chunk of my life and also as a startup guy, um, which is sort of what I do today. But along the way, uh, I was an ITF chair and an ARPA program manager and even worked for ICANN. and I can't manage a clicker. Um, today I work for a couple of companies that use DNS to do security, and we'll talk about how that works. But I'm also interested in edge computing, which I find a fascinating idea, but I'm not sure as whether or not it's a marketing vehicle by the 5G crowd. Um, and some AI phishing detections. Um, so what are the survival characteristics that we need when we're building systems that want to thrive. I think, you know, Darwin said that the secret to success is being adaptable rather than being strong. Um, you know, so being able to change to fit the circumstances is one of the key things. I think being powered by an expanding resource, in other words, you need to take advantage of some underlying trend and produce a new higher level resource, regardless of what you're doing. Um, we're, for example, today powered by the evolution of silicon technology and Moore's law and so forth. Um, the DNS was successful because it came around at the right time. There was a wave of computing power that was becoming available and networking, um, but also that it's been adaptable, and we'll talk about how that worked. When I talk about distributed systems, I always say they have three parts. Um, and you may wonder why I picked these particular icons. It's because the three parts are hardware, software, and configuration. Hardware is like milk. You want the best possible, the freshest. The newest stuff is always the best. Software is a little bit like wine, even though people want to change it constantly. Having software that has a little bit of wear on the tires, as we say, that's been around for a while is really where you want to be. The last part is configuration, and those icons are meant to reflect uh, death and taxes. That's the US tax form. Um, but it's really something that you wouldn't want to do, but you have to, to make things work together. And so the purpose of the DNS and the purpose of all of these configuration tools um, is to take advantage of the thrust that you get from the new hardware that's always faster, the new software which always has more lines of code, but being able to configure it um, is you know, really one of the key problems, and that's where the DNS came in a long time ago. Um, people are always whining, in my view, about, oh my god, these systems are so complex, I can barely keep track of them. They're also, um, you know, and 
The point is, is that's always going to be the case. We build systems right up to the edge of where we barely understand them. It's always going to be that way. Get used to it. Being at the bleeding edge, it's not called the bleeding edge for no reason at all. So it's a little bit, this is an American football analogy, but the reason that this guy is in such an inconvenient um, poise in order to try and capture that football is because there's the other guy that's trying to keep him from doing it, okay? People talk today about the complexity of routing algorithms, for example. Oh my God, this BGP thing, I barely understand it, it's so complex. It's because BGP is competition between carriers and it's also complexity that's right at the edge of what we understand how to manage. So the big key to tools like the DNS and so forth is to try and let you handle more complexity than you could before. And I think it succeeded. Um, so how do we get there? Um, you know, the way that the ARPANET and the internet errors evolved was they were adaptable. Um, they were powered, as I said before, by an expanding resource. That was things like Ethernet was out there to give you the ability to have your own network locally. There was things like the microprocessor, so you could have as many computers as you want, wanted. Now, there's a lot of people that say that really the, the key to the Internet was the genius of the fathers of the Internet and the Internet Hall of Fame guys and so forth. I don't think that's true. I think that the reason that the internet technology succeeded was you had this huge wave of bandwidth from ethernet, from fiber optics, all of these things. The ability to, to in silicon, get more computing and do more communication. So there was this huge tsunami. And it just so happened that the people who built the internet uh, decided to take their surfboards out and catch that wave while the people who were designing the OSI protocols we're still typesetting in Switzerland, okay? So, you know, the fact that you're first to harness that resource was really the reason. Um, it's being adaptable and, you know, as we say in California, nobody ever caught the back edge of the wave. The guy that gets on the wave and is surfing the wave, you're not gonna catch him from behind, doesn't happen. Same thing happens in technology. Um, so, you know, the reason that the internet technology was successful was that it was out there and it was available. I often say that, you know, the fact that, it, that the most popular implementation called BIND took over from other implementations that were available and superior was that it got distributed on the BSD tape. It came out with that Unix distribution. And the reason the internet technology succeeded was it was distributed on the same tape and the tape was free whereas all the other proprietary things cost money and you had to order the standard and it came nicely bound on nice paper from Switzerland, but it cost a lot, whereas you could download all of our specs for free. This is the story about the uh, internet and you know, the IP, TCP, et cetera family rather than just the DNS, but we'll talk about that now. Oh yeah, I guess I should say one last thing. The, Secret sauce, so the reason the DNS succeeded is it let the internet scale. Individual organizations could be masters of their own domain, which is not something that was available before. How did I get involved in this? One day John Postel came to me and said, I want you to go take a look at about five or so proposals for how we fix the problem. What's the problem? Well, in those days, there were these three people at SRI that were in charge of maintaining this phone book of the internet, which was a flat file, ASCII file, that listed all of the names of all of the machines and their addresses on the network. Um, so that was pretty simple, but it meant that if you wanted to add a new machine, you had to call up SRI, and you could only do that from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Pacific time, because otherwise they didn't answer the phone, because that was their working days. Um, and they might be busy and so forth and so on. The funny story about this was some people say, well, you know, you didn't really need to have this distributed system early on. Well, the people who were paying for people to answer the phone started out with three people that were answering the phone and had a lot of spare time to do other things. And towards the end, they had 23 people that were just charged with taking phone calls for people wanted to, to add new machines to the internet. 
So being able to distribute that function with the DNS uh, came at the right time. So what were the systems? Well, the candidate systems that I was supposed to use were IEN 116, which was um, a datagram-based thing that sort of came out of MIT, among other places. There were Xerox. Xerox, as well as DEC and IBM, all had their own systems. Um, and then there was the NSFNet name server. That, there was a proposal to the National Science Foundation that the way we solved the naming problem forever was to have a supercomputer in Wisconsin instead of this set of people in, at SRI. It didn't seem like it was very practical, but then the people from the University of Wisconsin thought it was a great idea. Um, and X500, which was the international standard. Now, I'm gonna tell you the answer to a question that isn't on this, that people frequently ask me, which is, Paul, how did you get this fantastic job? Was this like, you know, survivor or one of these things where there was 10 people on the island and you were the survivor or, you know, I, I, was there a big contest and you got the, you know, the golden ticket? How did, the answer is, at the time, nobody thought it was important. Nobody, okay? The important people of the internet, the Vint Cerfs and the Bob Cons, were worrying about how to send card images over TCP and doing all this other stuff. This was a problem that nobody thought was important. That's how I managed to sneak in and get the job. And that's how I managed to do my own thing rather than following orders, because the important people were too busy paying attention to other things. So how did I design it? Basically, I just went to my resume. Um, I worked on virtual machine technology for IBM, so the idea of having multiple systems that work together was, new, was not new to me. I had worked at what became the Media Lab at MIT. Now, at the time, the Media Lab was me and Nicholas Negroponte in two rooms. And nobody would give us big computers, they would only give us mini computers. So we started out with three mini computers and a disk drive, one disk drive. So what I did originally was to figure out how to make a distributed file system, okay, because I only had one disk drive and I had to share it. Okay, so I got a hardware guy to build a little bus and we built that. So the whole idea about b building distributed systems I made a big mistake. I made a file system that was only two levels of naming deep. And that just, ah, oh, geez, it was just such a problem, but I couldn't get people to change. So I said, never again would I build a fixed two uh, level system. And I don't care whether the answer was two or three. Xerox, for example, I hated that because they said, oh no, you need a three level. I said, no, 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 variable length, I don't care. And that was based upon there. Um, at Draper Labs, I actually was a rocket scientist for a while. And in those days, when you launched a satellite, the code was fixed, so it better work, all right? None of this jazz about reprogramming, you know, the Mars probes and so forth like they do, it seems like, every day today. But the whole idea about reliability through redundancy, so you'd have multiple actuators that would aim the rocket engines and so forth. This is where the DNS ideas all came from. That and then networking by name rather than anything else and that was with Dave Farber. So all of those people deserve credit rather than all of these things that the academics claim deserve credit. Um, another idea is, is that the DNS was based upon the idea that it should be as simple as possible. Uh, people tell me, for example, that, oh, gee, there was a big bug in the initial DNS because it has a big security flaw. Hey, it didn't have any security, okay? The Wright brothers did not have a drink card in their first plane, right? Nor a bathroom, not all the other things we expect to find in more modern aircraft. Um, the whole idea was to allow flexibility so that people could evolve and stick these features in as they became necessary, because getting the whole thing off the ground, uh, 30 years later we think, oh gee, well why didn't we have all that other stuff? And the answer was, at the time, this was difficult enough to just get it off the ground. Um, one of the other things I think is kind of interesting from the history of airplanes that I like to point out is from the time of the first commercial flight to the time of the modern jetliner was 40 years. It was from a Zeppelin to I think Comet was the name of the first jet airliner. 40 years it took to do that. 40 years after that we invented the wheelie bag to go onto that airplane. 
And the reason I bring that up is, is that there's clearly an opportunity to add simple ideas like the wheelie bag to a technology that's taken a whole lot of time to add. So when people say, well, the DNS is 30 years old, there's nothing possible we can add, I, I say, well, you know, commercial air travel took 40 years to get to the wheelie bag, which is a simple idea that I think is a great one. I think there's a possibility for the future. And I admit that's just my conjecture. So the philosophy, simple con uh, concepts that are sort of separate, Tree structure, why tree structure? It was the simplest thing that would allow us to create unique names and delegate. Um, why do we have different types? Well, because we want to allow for expansion. If I had followed the rules that I was supposed to follow, we would have only been able to do host names and addresses. Um, but I just said, if you're gonna build this system, you know, allow it to be expandable. And being expandable, I think, is one of the keys for its success. Did I make any mistakes? Well, you know, I could take a look at you know, just the way that names are there and people complain about how difficult it is to type Cyrillic characters and how they get, you know, uh, confused with Chinese character sets and so forth. Over half of the name types for the components of a domain name, in other words, the string in the domain name itself, were reserved at the time we built it. And I expected people to add things like binary they haven't. They never filled that in. That means that there's a bunch of wasted bits that go by in every DNS packet. Um, I'm saying this just to say that you can't always anticipate that. I think there's, it's necessarily a lossy th system. When you're trying to, to set things up so people can expand it, you're making guesses about which directions they want. And some of your guesses are going to be wrong. And I'm just documenting some of my wrong uh, guesses here just to show you that it's no story that's new. For example, one of the things I did was is that today all of people ever ask for is internet data type and a domain name and a query. Um, originally what I wanted to do was to say that, well, gee, I thought the query space could be expanded so that you could make more complicated queries. It never happened. The DNS never evolved in that direction. So there's always about 15 bits of wasted space in every DNS packet. And when you think about the trillions of packets that are out there, I probably use up a terabit or so of network bandwidth every day around the internet. But oh well. Um, one of the things that surprised me is, is that DNS packets, you know, the original spec said, oh, gee, you know, well, the MTU today, in other words, the maximum packet size that you are guaranteed to have is 512 bytes. I never in my wildest dream expected that that wouldn't get bigger. Do you realize that if you think about packets in terms of time as opposed to bits, have gotten smaller and smaller and smaller as the bandwidth? The bandwidth is a million times bigger and the packets are still the same MTU. Once upon a time there was this idea about ATM and small cell sizes. Well, it actually succeeded, but only because the, the, the time domain got squished. We waste so much of our resources today because we can't expand that basic packet size. And there, one of the reasons is we can't add digital signatures, which are often bigger than the data that you're signing. And it's sort of shape the whole thing. So there's some things you can't anticipate that profoundly shape the system. One of the things I thought was great was is that what we'd do is we'd have a standardized design for the database and then there's all of these things like name server processes and resolvers and all these little components and I thought that people would compete and plug into a standard database. Never happened. So okay, so there's a certain amount of humility I have about all these great design features that are in the uh, specs that never worked. So now I'm going to tell you about stuff that did work. Like the button on this thing. I wonder if my battery is dying. Whoops. So what happened? Well, what I designed, sort of as stated in RFCs 882 and 883, became kind of the foundation for the DNS. And when I talk about the DNS system, it isn't like it's really mine. I kind of did the basement 
and the first floor and the second floor, and then other people who came along and added all sorts of stuff on top of it. Uh, in a way, this is a good thing. People, I was doing an interview and people said, well, what, when were you first proud of the DNS? And I said, well, I think I was first proud of it when somebody else used it because they liked it as opposed to me building on my own thing. Because you always think your own baby is beautiful, right? When you have other people build on top of it. Although it does get to be a little bit like a Gaudi cathedral in the sense that some of the, the, some of the parts seem a little too complicated and ornate, but hey, that's what happens. This is a diagram of the DNS specification. Each one of those little colored blobs represents a document that's published by the IETF that de defines how you do various things um, with the DNS, like route email and so forth. So I think it, I'm colorblind, but I think those two little green blobs over there are the part that I designed. And the rest of this is stuff that other people have added. So when you think about the DNS system today, you have to realize that while I may have written the first hundred pages, there's now hundreds of documents that talk about how you do X with DNS, how you route mail, how you route phone calls, how you do mobile phone systems, how you do RFID tags. So the DNS has evolved to be kind of a truck that's a distributed database, and when people ask, well, what can you put in the DNS? I say, well, you know, it doesn't make judgments about what you can put into it. You know, whether or not what you put into it is a good design or not, that's up to you. But the job of the DNS is to be application neutral in my point of view. Now, there's a bunch of people at the IETF who think otherwise, but that's just my opinion. And that's certainly been uh, the way it's evolved. A side effect of this is that about half of those designs that you have there are above average. And about half of them are below average and then there's gotta be at least 10 of them that are really crappy, but that's the way life goes, all right? Um, you know, it's a little bit like having children at some point, well, they do what they want, and it isn't what you would have done, and in some cases it seems wrong, but it, it, it's just the way the system has evolved, and God bless it. Um, one of the things about the evolution of it is, is that 1989, the original design was set in about 1983 and the system went operational in 86. And so in 89, I went to NSF and I said, hi, I'd like some research money because, um, you know, I think that I can go and look at all the sites on the internet and build an index of it. So that's why the proposal was called index. And I can store that index in the DNS. And they said, nah, the internet has thousands of hosts, it's much too, big for anybody to index at all. Thank goodness those Google people didn't listen to NSF. Uh, and there was also like we should add security. And they said, no, we don't really need to add security. Um, so the result of it all is NSF had reviewers and I get the review forms back. And one reviewer said it was excellent. The other two said it was very good um, with some sort of side comments. So in case you wonder about NSF reviews, National Science Foundation in the US, two very goods is the kiss of death. That means they want to be polite, but they want to kill you. Oh well. So as far as I was concerned, that was the end of planned development. And I went off and, and started building mail servers and uh, routing hardware and so forth. But you know, the people that were adding things in the IETF and so forth continued on their merry way. Why do I always get two? Um, I guess in the future there's lots of things that we might think about adding. Um, we could think about evolving past the, the tree structure. Um, one of the things people keep asking me continuously, like every half hour, it's like, what about blockchain? Yes, I think it's cool. And I actually proposed adding some blockchain technology to the DNS about four years ago when I was working at ICANN. And I said, well, I can, you've got research money, let's do some blockchain stuff. And they said, no, no, it'll never work, it'll never catch on. So, I, you know, this, this whole business about having experts tell you what will work and what won't, I, I'm a little bit um, skeptical about. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about security. 
Um, those of you who are out there probably know about DNSSEC, which is a way to add uh, digital signatures on all the DNS data in the world. And it's somewhat con uh, controversial, although the ICANN and the ITF and the ISOC and all of the experts say we have to have it. So I believe them, but that's not what I'm going to talk to you about. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my day job and what I think is kind of interesting. And that is, if you take a look at all the DNS traffic that's going on in the world to route email um, and to show websites and so forth, much more traffic is generated by keeping the bad guys from actually doing that stuff. So for example, there's DNS traffic to decide whether or not you're going to accept mail from a, what might be a spam site or not. There's DNS traffic to try and authenticate this, that, and the other thing. There's also the capture of DNS traffic so you can try and see what's going on in the internet. So in reality, if you take a look at the useful DNS traffic and the stuff that routes your mail or routes your phone call or shows you a web page, it's actually a fraction of the traffic that's trying to keep the bad guys out. It's uh, amazing but true. How does this work? Well, what we do is we try and have reputation data about which domain names are naughty and which are nice. Um, you might say, well, wait a second, we have firewalls to do that. Well, traditional firewall works by IP address. When you take a look at content delivery networks, whether it's Cloudflare or Akamai or whatever, all of those content delivery networks at the same email address have vicious malware and great content, all at the same IP address. You can't use the IP address nearly as much with regard to content delivery networks. What you need to do is look a little bit at the domain name as well. Um, so that's where we now have this idea of DNS firewalls. But how do we make this whole system work? <laughs> um, you know, the typical enterprise network today, if you're trying to figure out how to have a consistent security uh, solution, it has like four different parts. There's the traditional enterprise network with routers and firewalls and Ethernet switch in the closet and so forth. But there's also the, the load that you have in the cloud, where you've moved some load into the cloud. There's also your teleworker who's you know, at a, uh, some internet cafe somewhere having paid for co coffee and free internet that may or may not be infected with malware. And lastly, down here in the basement, there's all of the heating and air conditioning and lighting, et cetera, systems that are increasingly all connected to the network. You know, we always talk about these SCADA systems and so forth, but the infrastructure of the building that you're in is probably also part of your internet. So how do we get a consistent protection uh, system set up for all of that? Basically, the problem is, is that you've got a whole bunch of stuff headed at you, and you're trying to figure out which parts, which messages, which queries are, are naughty and which are nice. What you'd really like is to have magic glasses so that the bad packets and the bad messages would light up as being red, and then you could just throw them away at the edge of the network. Well, you can sort of do that. Um, what we do is we take uh, a bunch of feeds. You can, there's threat feeds that are out there. You know, if you don't want to hear all the story about nasty companies and proprietary networks, there's open source lists of who the bad guys are. Uh, what we happen to do, and which every large enterprise is going to do, is they're going to take some number of threat feeds and combine them with some number of policies and then feed that down to all of their routers and DNS firewalls. The way we happen to do it is to use DNS to update not only DNS servers, which is very easy. You just use um, zone transfers and incremental transfers um, to your DNS servers, but we've also figured out how to program most firewalls. So what we'll do is we take all of these observations about lists of who are good domain names and IP addresses, we compare it with a policy, and all over DNS, 
we download that. So there's this big loop where we're distributing configuration information. Now we're not unique in doing that. If you want, you can go out to ultra DNS or quad eight or quad nine. Those are places where you have the solution out in the cloud. Now you may and may not want to expose all of your traffic to Cisco or um, Google or the quad eight people or the quad nine people. Uh, but what we do is we let you have your own customized policy and create the system where using DNS, we can feed all of the routers, firewalls, and DNS servers with co their configuration information, and we update it every few minutes. Uh, this is the same structure. There's an RPZ sort of standard that's out there that's sort of open source. The IETF is trying to decide how to standardize it. But basically, using DNS as a trans transit mechanism, we believe that the right way to think about security is to deliver in real time all the information about which domains and which IP addresses you want to block. Again, according to your policy. What do I mean by your policy? Some people may want to do geographic blocking. If what you're doing is you're a little website in Paris, France, we all know that you would never want to take orders for a croissant from the US because by the time they got there, they'd be no good, right? So you might just say, well, I'm only going to take traffic from inside France. Or you might know that there's a threat that's coming from a particular country and you might want to just say, I'm going to block all of their IP addresses. So being able to have customizable policies we think is important. And all we're doing at ThreatStop is we're allowing you to outsource it. For your security posture, if you want to do it in-house and have your CISOs and, and you know, staff do it, that's fine too. But I mean, I think that today, in order to do security, to say that you have a reasonable internet security policy means that you have to be thinking about having a first level of defense blocking at both the IP, the traditional firewall, as well as the DNS. Another aside for that is you need to be able to analyze what happened. Um, but this is an example where we were building this whole security world on top of the DNS. So that in reality, if you think about that diagram of all of the RFCs, that's yet another color code that we're going to have. And having the DNS watch itself is one of the evolutions that we're at. Longer term, the research community has name data network, information centric networking. It's this idea that everything that goes across the network it has both a name and is digitally signed. Um, it's an interesting evolution. I think it has a lot of le legs, but it's going to take a while. Um, historians might claim that it looks a lot like X509. These are the digital security certificates that you use. Once upon a time, they were very hard to make, but with the declining hardware costs, they're getting cheaper and cheaper. And in reality, what some people say is, is that really the whole research community is taking this old idea and putting it in new clothes in the sense that they're saying, well, okay, now we can afford to digitally sign everything, have a digital uh, signature on everything, and we can afford to give everything a name. So what we're doing is, originally we could only afford to do it for security certificates, now we're gonna do it for all content. It's an interesting idea. I've also heard some other people say that what you ought to do is, is that every piece of web content could optionally come with an insurance certificate that says, well, okay, we guarantee that if this hurts you, we'll pay. And then you don't necessarily uh, open arbitrary content, which is sort of what happens on the web today. When you go to the front page of your newspaper, some of the content comes from the newspaper, but most of it comes from ad brokers. And the newspaper doesn't really guarantee this. And you don't really know what you're looking at. And the whole idea that you can pick up content and decide whether or not you trust it by examining it closely enough really doesn't work. You can use names as a filtering mechanism um, and you can use those digital signatures and just decide who you want to trust. Um, I don't think that filtering by examining content is an idea that can work forever, but some people think so. Um, you know, so DNS has succeeded because it helps with scaling and federation. 
Uh, why would blockchain do that? Well, the DNS, we still have ICANN and we have these trusted registries and registrars. One of the things I wanted to do is to say, well, okay, could we build a domain that just manages itself? It has a set of rules and it uses blockchain and then away you go. Or we could make another one where we say, well, okay, we'll get rid of ICANN and instead we'll have a voting mechanism by the existing top level domains. Now, I'm not sure that's a really good idea, but the point is, is that you can think about having ways of automatically allowing the management of what we think of as the top level domain structure uh, by voting protocols or whatever that are embedded in algorithms. We could think about doing new and innovative things, and I think that's uh, where some of the research ought to go. So thank you very much, you've been a great audience, and I know I'm standing between you and your last beer, or maybe your first beer of the night. It would be my first beer, maybe your last. Um, uh, happy to take any questions. Okay, I'm coming to you, one second. Um, well, my, my question is from the entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneurial personality of you asking a question from the uh, perseverant personality of you that you invented the DNS. So like you, most probably most of the other entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs like myself, may have not persevered on the idea or dream they had. So they may have given up like I did. Um, what is your number one advice that how long we should persevere on, on a crazy idea like DNS that changed the world? Thank you so much for, for doing that. But what is your number one uh, advice on persevering on a crazy idea that we may have today that may have an effect after 10 years from now? Uh, well, okay, um, I'm, I'm gonna answer that two ways. The first way is, is that everybody has a metaphor. You know, they talk about, well, you know, like, that an entrepreneur is like, it's like a marathon. And other people will say, no, it's like a sprint and so forth. I've always found that, um, you know, entrepreneurship is a little bit like warfare. There's a lot of boredom but then there's these big intense bursts of effort that can really pay off. So that's my view. Um, I think it's all about picking the time. And you know, I think I already told you my, my metaphor about you, know, you can't catch the back of a, edge of a wave. You know, being able to put in intense effort just as the wave is getting there is the key to success. Um, I've been lucky rather than good because several of my enterprises have, have, have panned out. Um, sometimes because of me, sometimes against my best efforts. Um, the second way I'll answer that is, my metaphor is, is that it, life is like poker. The hard part is that sometimes you do the right thing and you get a bad result, okay? I mean, you bet the odds, but the reason there are odds is, is that the sometimes bad things happen that shouldn't because, you know, they're less likely. Um, so, you know, you gotta, you gotta figure out how to learn from your experience and understand that if your success, it might not have been because you were right, it might have been you were lucky. And being able to tell the difference between right and lucky and not getting one way or the other is my advice on that. Um, and as a poker player, it's never too early to throw in a bad hand. That's my last bit of advice. Thank you so much. Okay, who's next? Anyone? Sorry. Uh, thanks again for your uh, talk, Paul. Um, what advice would you have for an engineer? Because uh, you were mentioning earlier in some of your slides uh, that uh, with DNS that you did tend to over-engineer uh, in some regards uh, um, with regarding the protocol. Um, and I've experienced that myself as an engineer as well, that uh, when we're really fascinated about a certain, pro or a certain project and we get really deep involved into it, that we do have this tendency to kind of over-engineer. Um, what's, what's your advice to kind of uh, step back from that and not to make things too overly complex? Is that something, if you're really excited about it as an engineer, something that's just inevitable and you just have to deal with afterwards? <laughs> or is there something you can do ahead of time to kind of combat that? Well, my, you know, my, my expert uh, on system design is little Stevie Wonder. You know, he's the American singer. 
And one of his lyrics was, when you believe in things that you don't understand, then you suffer. So, you know, I believe that you have to understand what you're doing. Um, and I realize that there's lots of people who have Monte Carlo programming technique where they just kind of write stuff, compile it, and see what happens. Okay, I mean, software guys do this. I worked in both hardware and software, and the hardware guys like spend months doing validation and testing and simulation and so forth because, well, gee, you know, when you go to make a chip, it, it spends a month being made, and if you screwed up, it's going to be at least another month, where software guys are constantly just hitting that. So I, I think that what you have to do is you have to try and come up with a framework so you understand what you're doing. Um, and there's going to be some risk that's always there. You're always going to be trying to do things that you're not really sure would work, but you try and eliminate all of the complexity that you can. Um, and that's, I think it's an art rather than a science. But, uh, and I apologize, by the way, for the bad design of my slides, but I do my own. Oh, well. Anybody else? Thank you. Okay. Oops, sorry. Hi, Paul. Um, yeah. Thanks again for coming. How can these systems uh, can avoid that uh, exfiltration uh, through DNS queries? So if I somewhere, I or someone else inside the business can uh, steal data, if they want to send the data out, they need to exfiltrate it. They can exfiltrate it through DNS queries. These systems that, uh, th these companies that you work can do that or uh, they cannot? Uh, yeah, D DNS is a, as a method for data exfiltration is a well-known thing. Um, and it's one of the things that we look for. You remember when I said that you need to block things? In reality, that's an oversimplification. What you also need there, and what we do, is you have the ability to say, hey, this stuff over here needs to be looked at. So while we're not going to block it, we're going to log it, and we're going to analyze it, OK? So you can detect a lot of DNS exfiltration. But that being said, it's always a cat and mouse game. And if you have a low enough data rate, in other words, if the exfiltration is at a low enough rate and is obfuscating and basically hiding below the noise floor, it's very difficult to find, and you probably won't. Um, you know, that's, um, we can detect a lot of it, and a lot of it is done by script or standards. Um, I think the bad guys are better at sharing code than the good guys, frankly. Um, but there's a bunch of them. Uh, my favorite example of this was there was this one Chinese company that was offering uh, connectivity, and they would sell you connectivity. And basically what they did was they were selling you a system for using DNS exfiltration, because DNS queries by another Chinese ISP were not being filtered. So you could send them even if you weren't connected to their system. So it was interesting, because one ISP was selling bandwidth on the other one's DNS leakage. Um, Eventually, they detected it. Um, there's a lot of questions about the viability of UDP and things like DNS. Uh, for example, we have the memcache thing that just is out there. Um, you know, making systems that is, are resilient to attack is uh, an art that I don't think we've really perfected. Um, and there's still going to be problems out there. It's a whole lot easier to make a system that works if nobody's attacking you. I mean, but, you know, oh well. It's not clear that that works anymore in the real world. Thank you. So, final few questions. Where are we going? Short Somewhere answer there. is you can detect some but not all. At any rate. First round. Yeah. yeah. I th you guys are teasing him by making him run the longest distance you can, right? <laughs> And no, I'm not so sure if I really want to ask my question. Um, I, I like the analogy about aircraft and aircraft development, and it reminded me of um, Black Swans and uh, Nassim Taleb. Um, and I'm wondering, do Black Swans keep you awake at night when you're thinking about the future of like connectivity and the DNS? Uh, you know, the, oh. whole, the whole internet scares the bejesus out of me. <laughs> I mean, if you, 
I, if you know what's going on, you can't help but be scared. Okay. Um, so, um, I, you know, and I think that, uh, you know, we've made a conscious decision that we value functionality over security. And there's probably going to be a day where we think that was the wrong choice. Um, I wonder if there's any way to have kind of a soft landing. So that, for example, when I take out my, you know, I have my mobile phone here. And, you know, every time I add a new app on it, I fear that it's sort of like sharing a needle, right? Um, you know, there's, there's, there's a possibility that I'm going to get something bad. Um, and I really don't know what's going on in a bunch of the apps that I'm running. But I, I pick them for functionality. So, yeah, I'm scared. <laughs> Sorry. I wish I had a better uh, answer. I, I mean, I do think that things like virtual machine technology uh, could help a lot. I would prefer to have each app running in its own virtual machine and only having connectivity between the apps if I allow it. And being able to specify where apps can talk. But without being able to constrain connectivity in a fairly brute force kind of way, I'm not sure I understand how I build reasonably secure systems. Sorry if that sounds dystopian, but... No, that's what I wanted everybody to hear, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Any more final positive questions? <laughs> Maybe over in that corner, make me run a little bit further. Oh, it's really... <laughs> <laughs> make them run. <laughs> okay, thanks guys. It's like keep away with a microphone. <laughs> All right, I will come to you, don't worry. Okay, uh, I don't know if I did a get it right, but you talk one time about the DNS and the blockchain. Yeah. And in which way blockchain can be helpful to DNS? Well, I, like I said, I think that we could easily imagine having registries or registrars in the certain current parlance uh, be automatons, um, you know, set up with specific rules. Um, so that's how blockchain technology can help the DNS. I think the way DNS could help the blockchain is perhaps by providing a ubiquitous platform for a particular set of blockchain ideas. The one thing you can say about the DNS is, is that anything that can talk to the internet talks DNS. That's not even true for TCP. There are UDP-only devices. But as far as I know, I don't know of any devices that you know, aren't doing DNS, at least in some rudimentary form. Um, so, you know, I think that's the potential win-win. Um, and again, the, the challenge, remember my, you know, my milk and wine and death and taxes thing. Being able to automate configuration and being able to let people that don't necessarily trust each other work together or cooperate is the way to get leverage out of the increasing hardware and software value that we have. So I think blockchain is a potential winner there. And I think basing it on DNS is a way to make it accessible to a large part of the internet. Okay, I think we have time for two more questions. Do you actually want to ask a question? Okay. Are you asking a question? Okay, there was someone over there. Okay. And no, I don't have a fully baked answer about how to do it. I just have this intuitive feel that that's what's going on. Uh, hey, so actually my first question was exactly the same, and um, so I go to the second one. Um, because the, the DNS is basically a mesh network, right? You have these big nodes that uh, are in control of the smaller nodes, and uh, well, the bigger nodes, for example, you can block a whole country and not receive uh, um, any packages from, uh, from there. And uh, the... the the, the reason why the blockchain is decentralized is, be, is because of the economic incentive of keeping it decentralized, because basically it's, it's more expensive to go against the network than to by playing the rules. So uh, did you ever, uh, during uh, inventing the DNS, considered the decentralization of the network and how hard is it to, m is it to make a decentralized uh, uh, network without the proper incentives. Um. Sure. Um, well, the original, my original idea behind the DNS was to distribute authority. The, the original idea behind most business plans 
is to figure out how to have an unfair advantage or a monopoly. Uh, if you've ever you know, tried to get a venture capitalist to, to give you money, telling them that you have an unfair advantage and you're going to have a monopoly, that's, that, that's one of the check boxes. So, you know, the centralization that we have in the DNS around ICANN and so forth uh, is all business driven, okay? Um, now, I personally preach a different gospel. I tell companies when they come to me, they say, well, we have this DNS design. You know, we have caching servers and all this stuff. You know, we want you to tell, tell us if it's right or wrong. And I say, well, okay, if ICANN decides you don't exist, do you still, does your company still work? And what I mean still work is work internally. And you might say, Paul, that's a stupid thing. True story. Once upon a time, the state of California, we've all heard of California, right? The state of California, which uses the ca.gov domain, the people who run .gov said, we've found two computers in the state of California system that have pornography. We're deleting your domain name until you fix that. Now, the state of California has hundreds of thousands of computers, so the odds that they're all porn-free is zero, right? I mean, I probably you know, have email spam with pornography that's in my deleted folder as we speak, okay? But the point was is that they deleted ca.gov, so all of a sudden, the highway patrol and the different departments in the state of California couldn't talk to each other, okay? Because their intranet was broken. So the first thing I do when I have one of these consulting gigs is I say, well, okay, are you internally self-sufficient? And you know, if you're the law firm or you're the California Highway Patrol, it gets you most of the way done. Now, admittedly, if you're Amazon and you have to sell stuff, and if you can't talk to the outside world, that's a problem. You have a different thing. But you should be internally self-sufficient for your own internal operations. The other thing is, is that having a single trust anchor What's the right number of trust anchors? That, that could be the subject of, I don't know, a two-day talk. If you take a look at the digital certificate hierarchy in X509, there's hundreds of root certificate authorities that could issue certificates. What's the odds that one of them isn't either A, owned by bad guys, or B, has been hacked by bad guys? Zero, all right? Now, What's the golden mean? How many different authorities? I think that you as an organization, say, want to be able to have trust yourself as the root and then trust, say, what comes from ICANN as a secondary thing. So I think you need multiple trust anchors in any large-scale organizational system. So that, in a sense, that's not centralized because what you're doing is you're saying, I trust myself more than I trust ICANN. And, in, and that's just because you want to be able to fix yourself. You want to be able to be responsible for your own um, internals. You don't want to be dependent on outside uh, agencies if you can help it. Um, so if you believe that kind of um, trust model, you know, you're not really beholden to ICANN or whatever the central authority is. Um, but Another question that I admit is deep is, how do you figure out what's the right number of authorities to trust? You know, should you have two out of three voting? You know, um, there's the Yeti project in China where they basically said, well, okay, we're gonna go take all of the root data that ICANN publishes it, and we're gonna re-sign it and then distribute it. And you just go, oh, so they kind of like made this pass through here where if they ever decided they didn't wanna take ICANN's advice, they could just flick a switch and, and do it over. You know, sort of like, it's sort of amusing, because remember, getting the US government out of ICANN was because they might one day decide to take over. Well, you know, the Chinese are prototyping systems so they can do it. The Russians supposedly have their own system, and I don't, in a sense, blame them. I worked on a research project with a bunch of French and Germans about RFID tags, and they said, well, we don't want to be dependent upon ICANN's security. And I said, well, okay, well, have your own trust anchor at whatever domain name you want and have that be more important than the root. Uh, because the one thing about the, a tree structure is you can take any node and kind of shake it and make it the root from a standpoint of your view of trust. So maybe that's what you want to do. Um, that's a very complicated answer, but 
Um, I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to say is, is that I don't build systems that way for my own use. Um, I, I, I prefer to trust my own sources, unless it's, you know, the next door neighbor's computer. No, no, trust I can, whatever. Um, but, you know, from a standpoint of an organization, you build that kind of more complicated trust system. I'm sorry, I've gone way too long on that question, and I'm probably off in the weeds. Yeah, sorry, that's all we have time for, Paul. I think, uh, I think I've exhausted the audience. <laughs> Guys, please give a big round of applause for Paul. We really Thank look at you. having.